and welcome to I've Got a Cool Job, Aurora Public Library's interview series where we talk to professionals who perform interesting work. My name is Sam Marcello, and with me this week is Derek Heemsbergen. Hi, did Sam. Did I get that right? You did. That's exactly right. It's All almost right. like it's phonetic and you read it. Like it's you know phonetic. what? I practiced really hard. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I'm afraid of messing up someone's name. Oh, even if you did, it's okay. Plus, you're in a library, you're reading aloud all the time, right? So you've you've honed your skills for this moment, and they've paid off. I love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so before I get started interviewing with Derek, let's just kind of talk about who he is. So Derek Heemsbergen is a freelance localization editor with over 10 years of experience working in the video game industry. His past credits include journalistic work, podcasts, and written critique for enthusiast outlets such as RPGFan.com and the Canadian publication Comics and Gaming Magazine. Today, he now works as a Japanese to English localization editor, bringing scripts to life for games like Dragula Lost, Sukuna of Rice and Rune, and the Story of Seasons franchise, which I adore. He is a graduate of the University of Arizona and holds a Bachelor of Arts, oh, Bachelor of Arts degrees in both East Asian Studies and Linguistics. Derek, you're so talented. Well, thank you for saying so. Um, I'm trying my best. Ah, don't say try. You are doing your best. I'm doing all right. I'll say that. All right, Derek. So can you explain to the audience what a localizer does? Yeah, so this is always the fun question to be asked at parties. Remember parties like yes. a year and a half ago or more? I know. Um, I always have a hard time. Like I've thought this through over and over, like how I would want to encapsulate what my job is to, you know, to the the average outsider who's asking. Um, I do think uh, it's very, it's a very niche kind of job um, because it's like it's a role in the video game industry, which is very insular. It's hard to get into. Um, and even within that, there are so many different specialized roles that like it's hard to um, encapsulate all of your job duties in like a simple title. But um, so I'm a localization editor. And what that is, is I basically I work to help translate video games from Japanese into English because um, so many video games have their ori origin in Japan. Um, the Japanese video game market is extremely prolific. And of course, that necessitates translation. We need to be able to bring the games over into a language that people in uh, North America can understand, right? So um, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't say that my job title is a translator, but I do translate as part of it sometimes. Basically, I'm kind of a middleman. So um, when a video game script needs adaptation and translation into English, uh, I usually work with a translator or translators, and they provide kind of a rough pass of a video game script to be translated into English. Then I look at their translation and I edit it and adapt it um, into like more natural sounding English prose. And there are a lot of other facets that go into that. But basically, um, I'm kind of a middleman between a translator and then like a QA person who would be the last pair of eyes that looks at a video game script before it goes out to, to sale. That's fabulous. I, and I don't think a lot of people understand necessarily the amount of work that goes into uh, translating, localizing, and then QAing uh, any kind of a video game, especially ones that do come from Japan, where there's a lot of complexity in kind of what the game is, what the story might be, and yeah, how would you present that to an audience? Right. Um, I loved, truthfully, uh, the localization that was on the new story of Seasons, uh, especially uh, because I romanced Marie the Librarian. Oh, and yeah. one of my favorite bits of text was just when she's talking about this novel that she's recommending to somebody. And it's, as a librarian reading that, it's one of those just, it filled my heart with happiness because you got the exact kind of behavior of somebody who loves books so correct. <laughs> like just that frantic, like, let me tell you about this book. This book is fantastic. Why don't you love this book? Read this yes. book. Yes. Because we actually are like that. Oh, yeah. Anyone well, and you and I are like that. We're book people. We are. Remember, I, I used to work in a library, um, just yeah. as a page, mind you, but... Um, the love of books runs deep, and I'm glad that could be worked into the game. And of course, uh, I'll do credit to the translators that I worked with. I believe that was um, Liz Bushouse. Bushhouse? Oh my God, I've never said her last name aloud. Yes. Um, who, who translated that, but yes. No, you guys did fantastic work. And like I said, as a librarian, I was like beyond thrilled to see kind of my representation. It was fantastic. I'm delighted. So my next question is, how did you get into localization as a career? 
So this was a long and winding road. Um, it actually concerns how you and I met, or it includes that. You and I met um, when you were writing for RP Gamer, yep. still still working for them. Um, and I was working for the rival site, RPG Fan, rival right, site. which we've never actually been rivals, but there was this um, yarn that people like to spin about how we were in competition. Yep. Um, yeah, so I got my start uh, writing for RPGFan.com um, about a decade ago at this point. And I signed on to be a, a news editor, so writing news articles for them, just because I was extremely passionate about um, video games and specifically the subset of role-playing games, which are the ones that are more story-focused, where um, you know people like me have more work to do on them, like you know helping flesh out characters and stories and scripts. Um, so I was reporting for RPGFan.com, and um, in the course of that, you know, I started to I was critiquing video games and doing reviews of them. And I had always been interested in um, storytelling and kind of the written word ever since I was a kid. Um, going back just a little bit further, I remember when I was younger, um, I first noticed the power of very punchy text in um, a game called Lunar Silver Star Story on the PlayStation. The company that handled that was called Working Designs, and they were a localization company slash publisher who took a very, they, they had a very liberal creative approach to their translations, but they put extra attention into the text of video games. Like, it didn't have to be just, I am on a quest to defeat the bad guy. I will now go to the next area. Like, they would really color in the dialogue and the characterizations with very fun and modern um, writing. So I started to become interested in video game text, and like that's what led to my interest in writing for RPGFan.com. And then in the course of working for RPGFan.com, I always say that the, the catalyst game for me was this game that I discovered called The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky. Uh, this is a video game in a long running series in Japan. It's up to like 10, 10 entries at this point. Um, and this was a game that was localized by a company called Exceed. And they had uh, in particular two people who were working on the game, um, Jess Chavez and Brittany Avery. Um, they were two ladies who were very, um, open and forthright on Twitter about the challenges that went into localizing the game. And uh, I remember reading their stories about everything that went into making these scripts come to life and how exhausting it was, frankly, but but like how much it reflected in the end product. So as I discovered Trills in the Sky, I started to think, maybe I don't just want to write about games and critiquing them. Maybe I want to write for a game. That would be really cool. So I, um, as part of my reporting work at RPGFan.com, I went to an annual convention called Electronics Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles. It happens every June. It's a big expo for all the new video games coming out every year. Um, over the course of several years, I networked with some people, including folks at Exceed, um, and I eventually got my first opportunity to work on a, a game with them as an editor. Uh, it was called Fate Extella, the Umbral Star, and that was in 2016 or 17, I think. Um, and that was my first experience ever being able to work on a game script. and. Luckily, it seems like the people I've worked with have enjoyed my work, so I've been able to keep going from there, and I'm still doing it freelance for a couple different companies. That's amazing, and that's seems to be a lot of process in my understanding. Um, how a lot of people go about it, right? They they find one passion and it somehow leads them kind of to another. So that's really yeah. cool. Um, are there any particular education requirements that one must consider to get into the field? Um, so for, for my job specifically, for being a localization editor, there's not really, which is, which is actually a good thing because, um, you know, I'm a believer in the idea that uh, formal education can be as useful or as, as valuable as you want or need it to be. Um, I don't think you have to have a degree to work in, I mean, in my field, if, it, if I had my way, it would be more like people had specialized training to work in any field, of course, but um, yeah, so uh, I have a couple of Bachelor of Arts degrees in, in sort of related areas, but um, to be a localization editor, you don't need a specific degree of any kind. However, I would say um, the, the two things that would be very useful is, number one, because in my part of the industry, we're working with Japanese video games, um, you probably want to become familiar with Japanese as a language, and you actually you actually don't have to at all. I know several very skilled localization editors who have no Japanese knowledge whatsoever, and they're primarily working as English writers and editors, so you don't even need to know Japanese. But if you want to, there is a useful uh, curriculum called the JLPT, Japanese Language Proficiency Test, that is a, it's an internationally recognized standard for 
how good you are at Japanese. And um, there are five levels. I myself have passed the third level, the middle one, but that's all I have. And I, I mean, I look at Japanese text every day and I, I speak it, yes, but I wouldn't say that I'm like fully fluent um, as much as I would like to be. I'm still studying. Uh, so, you know, studying for the, the JLPT would be a useful thing that you could do if you wanted to have some kind of barometer to measure your proficiency and also a, uh, a credential that you can give to potential employers. But no, um, you don't actually need to have a specific education whatsoever. I would just say the second most important thing or the other most important thing would be read, 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 read. Find books that speak to you, find stories that resonate find authors you really idolize and just like dig deep into their work and find out what what makes it so special to you because i think that the best way to improve as a writer is to be a voracious reader and that's kind of i think what's helped me develop um, my own writing style um i did want to say before we move on to the next question i yeah. i wanted to mention as part of my um <clears throat> education i was pushed by my advisor, and I'm, I'm so glad she did. She pushed me to write my senior capstone paper on video game localization. And um, I was lucky enough to have that paper published. So I have a paper, if you're interested in, in localization, it's called Eat Your Hamburgers, Apollo, a survey of Japanese video game localization messages, uh, met methods and challenges, excuse me. Um, the title is a, a joke based on a comic um, talking about video game localization. Uh, uh, anyway, it's it's published in the uh, Arizona Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies. Again, it's called Eat Your Hamburgers, Apollo. And I go very in depth in, in that paper um, about what localization is, the challenges of adapting from Japanese to English, and um, provide some resources if you're curious about learning more. So uh, again, while you don't need to have a formalized education to get into localization, maybe you could look at that paper if it interests you and see like what related fields you might want to study uh, but otherwise, it's just about sharpening your own talent and creativity and drive. I'll make sure that paper is linked when we post the video. I read your paper years ago, and I remember being so fascinated by all your research. So I appreciate that you even put yourself out there in such a way like that. That's I great. feel extremely fortunate I do that actually, I got published in the first place. So I'm grateful You, you for did that. an amazing job. I do have a question based on something you mentioned, though. You said that reading was a key factor to your work. What are some of the authors then that inspired you? Ooh, good question. Um, probably if I had to say like, who's my favorite author, it would be Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, I absolutely love uh, her. I've only actually read the first in her Earthsea series, but I've read um, a bunch of other hands like The Left Hand of Darkness, The Way of Heaven. Um, she has a humanist philosophy underpinning a lot of her writing, and I just find her prose so elegant and beautiful. Um, in my teens, I was a big Stephen King fan, loved the Dark Tower series, read all of those. Um, these days, I'm reading a lot of fiction by Japanese female authors. Um, it's, it's kind of a, an exploding little subsection of a subsection of a subsection in literature in um, the English market. There's like, oh, let's see. Um, let me think of some authors that I'm reading right now. Well, I'll give you a good one. Have you read, Me is it Meiko Kawakami? Because she's the one who yes. wrote Breast and Eggs, and that book yes, is fantastic. I, yes, I just recently read Breast and Eggs. That so was that really one. good. Yes, <laughs> um, the the uh, Morrow Police. What's it called? It's by Yoko. Memory Ogawa. Police. Memory Police. Thank That's, you. I haven't read that one yet, but I've heard it's fantastic. Yes. I mean, my my go-to for old school Japanese ladies was always Banana Yoshimoto. I mean, I've yes. read every single one of her um, books. And oh, you have. They're That's beautiful. more than me. Read them. Yeah, they're I've, good. I, I've read. I've read NP. Uh, I think that's the only one of hers that I've read, but I have, I think I have a couple of them sitting on the shelf right over there. Um, <laughs> and also there's a book, gosh, I'm spacing on the, the author. Um, this is How You Lose the Time War. Are you yes. familiar with this book? Oh. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> Max S Silverstone. Was there a Silverstone in there? Gladstone? I, I, I want to believe that. Some kind of stone. <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're giving some good recommendations here to the yeah. listeners, right? Like yeah. there are so many great authors out there. Um, that you can be inspired by. And again, Japanese literature is its own unique area of just the fantastical, right? Yeah. So I love it. I love yeah. it so much. Okay, Derek. So what are some of the challenges that come with localizing Japanese language to English? There are a couple of specific ones. And again, if any of this, um, you know, 
if I'm not explaining myself very well, uh, I promise I go into more of this in that paper that you can always reference. But um, so there are some unique challenges in Japanese to English localization. The first one that always comes to mind is character limits. When I say character, I don't mean like a character, you know, in a novel or a movie. I mean a letter, right? Um, Japanese, as you may know, is written in a different orthography as English. Um, they use three different uh, symbolic systems. They have hiragana, katakana, and kanji. Um, one is basically like a phonetic alphabet. One is a phonetic alphabet for loan words, more or less. And one is the, the Chinese characters that you're probably, when you think of Japanese writing, you're probably thinking of kanji for the most part. Uh, all these Chinese characters, each one is like a single character that has a meaning embedded in it. And Japanese has, uh, you know, Kanji have multiple readings depending on the way that they're placed in a compound. They could be the Chinese reading, the onyomi, or the Japanese reading, the kunyomi. All this is to say that Japanese is a lot more dense of a language than English, like on a per character basis. Um, so when you're looking at a script that's written in Japanese, they can have a lot more information in a much shorter uh, space, you know, of writing. So when you're working on a game, you have to uh, be able to fit all of the English translation into the same text box in the video game. And this gets into engineering. Um, but sometimes, you know, a game will only let you have, you know, say, let's say I'm working on a, a fantasy video game and I'm doing a list of items that you can use. Each of them may only allow six characters. And in Japanese, maybe I have like a four kanji compound that means, you know, incredible herbaceous elixir of maximum vitality or something. And so I have to find a way to render that in English in only like five or six letters. Um, and thankfully, these days, we have a lot more power. I say we, because I'm, I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm very grateful to all the people who are. Uh, we have a lot more leeway in creating uh, larger spaces to work with or whatever. But so character limits are a thing. You have to be able to fit the text in the box in the game. So sometimes that necessitates shortening things down. Of course, there's also um, Japanese, like the idiosyncrasies of Japanese culture um, in Japanese, there are such a thing as honorifics that are attached to people's names. If you've ever watched anime or if you have any familiarity with Japanese at all, you might know, like, uh, we use san as a suffix, like, you know, uh, Marcello-san, who I'm speaking to, would be, you know, more or less an equivalent of, like, Ms. Marcello. It's, it's a, a way to denote respect. Um, so we have to decide if we're bringing a game over from Japanese into English, are we going to keep those honorifics? Uh, are we going to sort of, um, are we going to work them into the script? Like, so if I'm talking to Sam, maybe I'm not going to use San in the final text, but I'm going to have the character speak in a more formal register, uh, more formal vocabulary to kind of embed the respect that they're showing that person. So there's a lot of um, kind of subtle things that you have to consider beyond just this word means item. I'm going to translate it as item. Uh, so you have to think about Japanese uh, hierarchical signifiers, as we call them. And then also puns, wordplay. Anytime there's uh, any kind of a joke or like maybe they're using the Japanese kanji to be read in a weird subversive way to make a joke, like all this kind of stuff has to be considered when you're making the final text. Um, and that goes for more than just Japanese into English, of course. But that, that's some of the unique challenges that we have in this, this field with this language. Okay. Have you localized anything beyond video games? I have worked on a, a book uh, related to one of the video games that I worked on um, for Fate Extella, the Emerald Star. I worked on kind of an encyclopedia compendium that worked uh, or that tied into it that you got if you purchased the game. But other than that, I've, I've been pretty squarely in video games this whole time. I've also worked on some um, liner notes for albums. I have a, uh, I've worked for a company called Brave Wave, which is a Japanese uh, music label, sorry. Uh, the, the label publishes Japanese video game music. And so I've helped work on some other liner notes for their, their albums by translating or editing the, the notes in there. Like when you open up the CD, what you see in the inside, but mostly video games, all video game related, we'll say. Almost all video game related. That's still pretty yeah. cool, though. I mean, I don't know too many people, even outside of the people I've spoken to in localization, that have gone beyond games. I mean, I think there's, it's harder to get into even comics or, and comic, again, comics has its own, I think, uh, approach compared to games. Like, um, localization, 
even when I try to describe it to people, I think there's always the struggle that it's specifically just one thing. Um, and, you know, even just doing the liner notes, there's probably even a specific way that you had to do that compared to when you're, I guess, translating or localizing a game rather. Right. Like, like just the formatting might differ or, um, you know, it, there's a difference between right, like translating or adapting somebody's comments on a music track that they composed versus a character in a video game and how they speak. So you want, you want to represent each one appropriately. No, that's amazing. If someone were to go into localization as a profession, what is the big piece of advice that you would give them? Um, again, read, read, read. So important. Uh, develop your own voice, develop a writing style. You don't have to be a published writer or author by any means, but um, f figuring out how you like to write and how you want to color stories with your own text is very important. And the other biggest thing I would say is it's all about networking. Um, I don't think that anyone should have to work for free, but at the same time, I recognize that the reality of the video game industry is that it is extremely competitive and it is extremely insular, um, which is not to say that you can't get into it uh, if you're not a known face or name, but it takes a lot of time, in my experience, to sort of build up to the point where you can, um, you know, start professionally editing a game script or something. So when I mentioned working for RPG Fan, um, that's how I got to know some of the people who gave me my first opportunities. And then from there, it's just been sort of uh, cascading one after the other. And I'm extremely grateful for that. But uh, I wouldn't have gotten any of this, I don't think, if I hadn't just seen a call for volunteer writers on RPG Fan and thought, you know what, I'm going to go for it. So I would absolutely encourage you if there's anybody in the field like um, that you you see on Twitter or something, maybe reach out. I, I'm not going to volunteer everybody's time, you know, to provide free career advice. But but I mean, if people reach out to me and they're like, "Hey, how did you get your start?" I'm I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so yeah, I would just say uh, research the the field and reach out to people and. If you see any volunteer writing opportunities, go for them. Even better if they're paid. They should be paid. But yes. Yeah. I uh, agree just, with you on, on the payment part for sure. Yeah. But just get in there. Don't don't be afraid to send uh, messages or emails. Um, I have never balked at a respectful email that says, hi, I saw your work and I'm curious how you got into the field. Like, I'm happy to answer that. So I think there are lots of other professionals out there who also are. So just reach out. The worst that could happen is they're busy and or can't because they're under non-disclosure agreement, which happens to me sometimes. Yep. <laughs> the good old NDA. Right. My last question, dear, is what was your favorite project that you've worked on that you can talk about? I would say probably it is uh, a game called Dragalia Lost that I am still working on. It is a uh, smartphone game, so you can play it on your Android or, or Apple phone. And it's a role-playing game that's made by Nintendo and Psy Games, who is a pretty prolific Japanese uh, game publisher. Um, Dragalia Lost is a really fun game that's a story of humans who um, have packs with these sort of these dragons that are kind of like gods in their world. And it's all the adventures they have. They're, you play as the prince of this country um, called Grastea, and it's all about his struggles and his allies. Um, it's a very fun kind of swords and sorcery uh, fantasy adventure. And the really fun thing about it is it's always growing because it's an ongoing title. Um, there's new characters and new stories added every couple weeks, every month. And the characters and the stories have so many different genres and styles and personalities for the characters represented among them. Um, we have horror, we have murder mystery. Well, it, wow, it's not all that bad. It's not that grim. Um, I was going to say, have, I'm like, that's a little scary. We have beach vacation. We have um, uh, like I'm, I'm struggling to think of different things. It, all these different stories, right? Um, like talking about nature and stuff. And because there are so many different kinds of characters represented, I get to really have a lot of fun playing with their dialogue. Um, I get to have more creative freedom in Dragalia Lost and some other games, just because so many of the characters are meant to sound modern and hip. Um, so it's a lot of fun to to play around with them. 
That's fantastic. Again, I'm always fascinated by what you do and I love seeing your projects as they, you know, come to light. I've been so proud of you, especially because, you know, we've known each other such a long time. So Derek, thank you so much for coming and talking to the Aurora Public Library today about what you do. It's truly appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on. Thank you. And we'll be back next month with somebody else. (laughs) Bye. It's not me. Bye. Bye.